Welcome to the Ad Nauseam Podcast, where classical gourmands everywhere can finally get their fill. Join us for a delectable discussion of Greco-Roman civilization stretching from the Minoans and Mycenaeans through the Renaissance and right down to the present. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here are your hosts, Dr. David Noe and Dr. Jeff Winkle. Welcome, listeners, to episode 119 of the Ad Nauseam Podcast. My name is Dr. Jeff Winkle. I'm down here in Vomitorium South, otherwise known as The Bunker, with my good friend and co-host, uh, Dr. David Noe. How you feeling, Dave? I'm doing real well, Jeff. Yeah? I'm quite excited about this episode. And you know, I don't use the E word very often. That's, that's very true. Okay. That excitement. Right. Uh, spring is in the air here in Michigan. Finally. Finally, some really nice weather, and uh, we're going to launch into the first part of book 12 of the Aeneid. Right. It so, has been an epic journey, am I right? It has, and we're nearing the end. We are. So, I mean, I, it looks like we'll have just a couple more episodes, including this one, yes. uh, on the Aeneid before we finally wrap this up. That's right. It's been kind of a, a, a years long, it almost, has. almost literally a years long journey. Right. Now, we have interrupted it or punctuated it with mm-hmm. some variety here and there. Um, I learned a new word this week. What's that? Um, uh, a listener uh, wrote in and said, that the Tarzan episodes were a little off piste, P I S T E, or I think I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, what does that mean? It means not on the normal ski slope. Oh, really? Yeah, who knew? Okay, well, what hill were we on? I don't know. <laughs> the bunny hill? Yeah. I mean, I think I think suicide that, slalom. I think that's that's probably that's correct. Right. It, it was kind of off the off the beaten path. Yeah, but we're niche. We it's true. That's right. That's true, exactly. So. And without apology. That's right. That's yeah, right. I think it was you who said last week. There's no one who's doing a podcast episode on Tarzan and uh, classical precedent. It's, it has to be kind of an example of it's one. Sui generis, I'm right. sure. Yeah. But how are you feeling, Jeff? I'm, I'm feeling really good. Before I swung by and, and picked you up this afternoon, I, I was early as I usually am. Yes. So I stopped and I took a nice long walk under the bright sunshine. Nice. And you know, all the flowers and the trees are in bloom. It's, mm-hmm. it, it, was, it was great. Are you participating? Are the Winkles participating in the No Mo May what is? I have no you idea what that seen is. This? No, what's it? What is well, it? I see the signs around in the yards and so forth. No, N O M O. N O M O W. The no mo. Oh, they're not mowing their yards in order to feed the bees. Oh, is that right? Yes. Is there some kind of bee crisis going on? I don't know. Apparently, and um, not only does one have to do that, one has to tell all one's neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my neighbor's not listening, but if he were, you so are know. you mowing? Are you? Are you oh, an- I'm mowing. Or are you? You're, so you're anti bee? Oh yes, <laughs> right. I just run the lawnmower around looking for bees. Yeah, yeah. You no, know, the idea is you let the weeds grow up, and that helps feed the bees with their pollinating and oh, so okay. forth. And I'm sure it's a it's a worthy cause, and yeah. I'm probably speaking from my typical ignorance here. Yeah. You know, I, my my wife is a huge gardener. Oh yeah. You know, in in your garden, you, how large a garden does she like? Well, it's as big as she can make it. She okay. can, she is um I mean even this this past week she keeps digging up more of our of the green lawn oh, yeah. and it's turning it into a garden, which is fine, which is less for me to mow. Exactly. Right. But I bought for her last year um I think for Mother's Day, one of those like bee houses. Oh yeah, and uh, you can nail it to a tree. Yeah, not one bee yeah. uh, came by to 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 move in. So I don't know. I don't Did know. you you know bake some cookies in it? They say that if you have some smell of fresh bread baking or something like that. Was it furnished? Apparently, if the place is furnished, it goes faster. Well, it's kind of, it's one of the, have you seen these little houses that got like these little kind of wooden tubes? Okay, which are apparently are very attractive to bees. Apparently they want, not. They want, and apparently not. No. The bees came in, took one look around, and said, "We can no, do better." Exactly. You know, huh. the rent is way too high. Yeah. So I'm, I might, I might. I mean, I haven't mowed yet this May. Yeah. I might not mow. You might not. Yeah. Well, the great thing is you can not mow and turn it into a virtue for not doing something. <laughs> that's right. Which that, would be that, wonderful. That's a I, that's a draw for me. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of virtues for not doing something, yeah. do we have a shout out this week? We, we do not. No, we don't. So another another week with no yeah. shout out. Right? What do we put in there? What's in the script? Well, it says uh, no grazie. Yeah. Yeah. Which is Italian, if I'm not mistaken. It is. All right. So, does it well, irritate you when people say grazie? I thought it was grazie. It is grazie, but when, but you know, the, when you ever see it on like commercials, or oh, you, I haven't. You know, seen like it. when one you're of the, watching a lot of prego commercials, well, a you, lot of ragu, like you know, like a, a fast food uh, restaurant will have you know introduce some kind of like Italian sandwich, right? And it's a grazie, <laughs> right? Uh, but it is, it's grazie, grazie. Right, so. Yeah. Oh, well. I find that just mildly annoying. I'm just right. Just hearing that. Maybe we should devote a whole hour to the things that uh, irritate us. Isn't that what we do every week? I think so. <laughs> and an hour is probably not enough. That's right. Right. So what are we talking about today, Dave? Book 12, yeah. part one. And this is the Duomachia. 
right? Duel this, Machia. Yes. This is where mm -hmm. Turnus and Aeneas finally come to blows, and I think they decide to settle it in a, a fairly wise fashion. They stand in for their respective sides. Correct. Right? Yes. And I would like to, at some point during this episode, pontificate a little bit about political systems, because this raised some interesting questions in my mind. Really? Absolutely. I look forward to it. Okay. All right. But I think that you yes. have the opening quote. I do. This comes from um, an author who's got way too many abbreviated initials. In, in four. My, four. R-O-A-M, Rome. Yeah. Uh, line. Now, it had to be his parents' special joke, not just to give him four initials, but to make it an acronym, right? Rome, yeah, yeah, exactly. Crazy. Yeah, yeah. So I, my sense is that well, scholars will often, you know, uh, add like extra initials because they want sure. to distinguish themselves from somebody who has a very a similar name. Yeah, that's com compendiary padding. Yeah, exactly. So it, it's another thing I find kind of a little mildly annoying, right? <laughs> that's so how, two if you're keeping yeah. how many, count at how home. How many other R lines were there out there? In yeah. The, I, I don't know. My but, favorite is when you, you abbreviate the first initial and then stress the middle name, right? Like J. Thomas Winkle. Oh yeah, you, that sounds much more, um, you know, dignified than Jeff. It does. No offense. No, it, it, no, like the the rhythm to it, the Correct. cadence to it. Right? J. Thomas Winkle. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. All but right. Anyway, so what does line well, say? Line, What's the title of the uh, the title of the article, article is is Lavinia's blush, uh, Virgil Aeneid uh, twelve uh, line sixty four to seventy, and we've talked a bit about Lavinia um, in in a much along the lines of how little Virgil has to say about Lavinia. Correct. Right. She's kind of this. Um, Cipher, this this silent character that's right. who doesn't get a lot of page time. That's correct. Um, and so that's one of the reasons I chose this article is because I thought this was an interesting way of kind of bring, bringing her, drawing her out. Right. right. And now a listener who's a, a super fan, he sent me some um, communication with respect to the, the most recent Aeneid episode in which he said that some novelist has written a, a full-length treatment of Lavinia. Now, I can't remember the novelist's name. Is that right? But he said, this gap we've noticed has already been plugged. Okay, all right. That, I mean, that seems to be kind of a, a thing right now. Right. Uh, like, uh, like with Madeline Miller's, you know, Circe. You kinda, right. You, t you take the, the dangling thread and you weave a whole new tapestry out of it. Mm -hmm. which, um, which I think is... I, I think it's, it's very appealing. It's very appealing. It's a great idea, right? But the market is fuller than we had thought. Remember, we, right. were, we were going to write that romance novel together? But exactly, and, right. Uh, cash in? I think we still should. Okay. We, we still should because, I mean, whatever we came up would be way better than whatever this guy's <laughs> uh -huh. uh, Maybe. So the source of this article yes. is the, the journal Greece and Rome. Yep. Aptly named. Yep. This goes back to uh, 1983. Yes. And um, Mr. Line writes this. He says, in the Aeneid, actions are consistent with character and psychology. Indeed, indicative of character and psychology. The statement has, I think, general, if not universal truth. At any rate, one should not hastily assume otherwise. Can we pause there a minute? Yeah. I think this is a worthwhile quote in terms of what's coming next. Mm -hmm. But I found this sentence so throwaway when I first read it, right? He makes this statement. It's a general, if not, in fact, a universal truth that uh, in the Aeneid, character and psychology are consistent, yes. right? Actions are consistent with character and psychology. But then he adds this caveat, at any rate, one should not hastily assume otherwise. Mm. It's very throwaway. It is very throwaway. You could apply yeah. that sentence to about anything, <laughs> right. right? So right. I'm having this for lunch. At any rate, one should not hastily assume that I'm having something else. <laughs> right, right, right. It, it's really padding. Right, exactly. Right, right, right. But he, go on. Gotcha, right. So he writes, Amada begs Turnus not to fight Aeneas. So it, as we'll, we'll get into yes. this, um, you know, it starts with this, uh, um, this would-be duel. Right. We're going to solve this whole conflict by just having Aeneas and Turnus fight. And Amada, Turnus' uh, mother, does not want him to do it. Um, Lavinia is not, not Turnus' mother. Sorry. Um, mother-in-law. Mother-in-law. Prospective mother-in-law. Exactly right. Uh, begs Turnus not to fight Aeneas. And Lavinia is listening. And she weeps and she blushes. Would you mind right. reading a little Latin here? Oh, I'd love to, okay. especially this early in the episode. So yeah. this is uh, book 12, lines 64 and following. Following. Ac pit vo chem lacrimis Lavinia matris, fla grantis per fusigenas qui plurdremus ignem, subjecit ruboret calafacta per ora cucurdret, Indum sanguineo veluti vio laureret ostro. Sequisabur aut mixta rubent ubi lilia multa. Alba rosa talis virgo dabat ora colores. Illum turbat amor. And, and that's where the that, line is. That's where the line is. Right. Yes. Um, nicely done, as always. Thank you. Um, and here's Lombardo's translations of those lines. Lavinia heard her mother's words. Tears stinging her cheeks and the blood ran to her face. Like crimson dye staining Indian ivory. Or the blush of white lilies mingled with roses. Turnus stared at the girl, distraught by his love for her. Mm. And going on with Lyon's article here. Right. It is a famous blush and a famous simile. Two similes, of course, but the second tends to get overlooked. 
Neither has been properly explained. Nor for that matter has Lavinia's weeping. Why does she weep? And why does she blush? To most scholars, Lavinia is not a character with feelings and emotions. Naturally, therefore, her own state of mind cannot supply answers to these questions. But some scholars do have a sense of, uh, have a char- have a sense of character, in particular in these lines. Some scholars even sense that Lavinia is in love. But with whom? If Lavinia were characterized enough to be in love, I would find this a welcome touch of color, pharmacon, in the outline of the muthos at this point. The poem would be richer. If there was any suggestion that she was in love with specifically Turnus, this would be troubling. It would seriously complicate our emotional, if not our moral, response to the rapidly approaching denimois. But that is not implausible. Our responses to the denimois are pretty complex already. And it is, in fact, the case. Lavinia comes alive in these lines. Lavinia, the text ad umbrates, is in love with Turnus. Hmm. So what do you think of that? Yeah. Is there enough question. in that in that simile that we could mm. we could kind of infer that Lavinia has as, as much feelings for Turnus as he apparently does for her? Right. So yeah. I have two responses. Yeah. The first is I wonder if there is some more contemporary post nineteenth century sense of romantic love being read into the text. Mm-hmm. In other words, looking for Lavinia to have a kind of emotional response that we may read in some 19th century novel, Victor Hugo or something. Yes. Now, as a counter to that, it's very similar to what happens between uh, Dido and Aeneas. Yeah. So so maybe that's not a good objection. Right. Uh, the second objection or second question is, it seems more likely that she is blushing because she has become the object of two men's attention leading to devastation and civil war. Uh. And so she's a counterpoint to Helen's general unblushing character. She's more Helen than she is Dido here, right? She's more Helen than Dido. Yes. But she's put in a better light than Helen because Helen doesn't seem to have enough shame for the position that she's in. Okay. We do have that one scene. It's book two, I think, looking... Uh, I can't remember the exactly. Deco- the Tecoscopia. Tecoscopia. Looking yep. down from the walls. Maybe it's book three, actually. Yeah. And um, Priam comforts her. It's really not your fault. So right. she has some... Uh, shame and, and sorrow for what she has done. Mm-hmm. But here, Lavinia seems to have a lot more. Yeah. So that'd be my initial response. That's that's really, I hadn't thought of it that way, but I, I find that very persuasive. Um, I'm not sure how much I buy the fact that we can read this as as her being in love with Turnus. Yeah. But I was thinking that to follow that, so let's, you know, for the sake of argument, accept that is true. Um, I like that in that it makes... Um, Aeneas's ultimate triumph that much more messy. Okay. Right. And so he, it's, it's another, um, you know, he kind of, he messed up the, 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 uh, his uh, relationship with Dado due to the demands of fate. Right. And also now he's going to mess up the love affair between Turnus and Lavinia mm-hmm. because of the demands of fate. And so it's another one of these, these costs that comes in the wake of Aeneas right. doing what is demanded of him. Right. And so against that, it's that, it's that, the, the, the that huge weight um, that it takes to found what needs to be founded. I, I find that very persuasive. Do you think that this final line, uh, Lavinia comes alive in these lines, Lavinia, the text Adam Brates, is in love with Turnus. Does, is this proof that she's in love with Turnus? Or is it just she's uh, presented as the very shy, naive girl who blushes when uh, this man, Turnus, you know, looks at her with complex emotions of love. Right. She, she can read his mind a little bit by his body language and she's embarrassed, embarrassed on the by spot. It. Yeah. I don't think it's proof, but I do think it's an interesting idea that could lead you down some some um, you know, kind of fruitful uh, interpretive paths. Right. I like yeah. fruitful paths. Here's yeah. another question. Yeah. He says in the quote, to most scholars, Lavinia is not a character with feelings and emotions. Mm-hmm. So I want to examine that question for just a moment. When a character is in a work like this, if the character does not speak, if the character does not act very much, is that indicative that the author is telling us the person has no emotions, no feelings, no purposes, or is the author doing something more subtle and uh, complicated, just not revealing what those characters' emotions and feelings are, right. so that we can, with our imagination, fill it in right. in a way consistent with the rest of the story? I would say choice B. Yeah. And, and, and with Virgil, is, um, I'm always going to give him the benefit of the doubt. It kind of right. reminded me of... You know, Aeschylus and his famous silent character. So he's right. not just putting someone on the stage for the sake of putting on the stage. Right. It's meant to kind of 
draw the audience uh, kind of uneasily in that direction, right. right? And so I think the same thing with Lavinia. As Euripides famously mocks, right, in The Frogs, he brings someone on Aristophanes, stage. Aristophanes, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, but it's in the voice of... Oh, you're, that's right, Euripides. Sorry, Aristophanes right. wrote it, but Euripides is saying he brings someone on the stage <laughs> who stands there for three acts saying nothing. Right, right, right. Finally, he lets loose. Right, exactly. With one of those big jaw-breaking words. <laughs> right, right. But I think this kind of question here, Lavinia is not a character with feelings and emotions, that will really determine our later discussion of, so what is she doing in the novel? Yes. Because if she has no emotions and feelings, then, you know, we're really not justified in speculating as to what they are. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. All right. Let's, let's dive into the, the, the book proper. All right. So, um, so what would you say is uh, the thesis, well, I th the first half of the book? I think that it was, um, and so uh, in pr prepping for this episode... Um, I really was kind of concentrating just on the first half. I wasn't trying to read ahead. I wanted right. to really kind of, kind of contain it to what I knew that we'd be able to cover. That's wise. And As though you didn't know the story and you were going through it for the first time. Exactly, right. And it's been a while since I've read book 12. Exactly. So um, um, I wanted to kind of, you know, make it as, keep it as fresh as possible. Yeah, as, as Holtzmark taught us last week, right, you have to suspend belief. Yes. If you're going to enjoy literature. Exactly. The whole thing is a fantasy world. Exactly. And what really struck me this time around is... How often uh, Virgil puts into the, the the speeches of Aeneas this very civilized outlook. He's he's starting to think about um, okay, what's what's beyond this war. He seems to kind of accept it. Yes, I'm chosen by fate, and I'm going to be the victor here. But that comes with a massive amount of responsibility. And so, uh, you know, when he's thinking about this duel with Turnus, when he's thinking about what's going to happen with his son, when he's thinking about what kind of um, you know, structure the rulership is going to be after right. this war. He has these very kind of um, organized, very civilized um, thoughts and things to say. But when we get to almost exactly halfway through uh, the book, uh, he takes a turn towards the, the savage mm. and the era, the rage right. um, overtakes him. And I think that's what is, it, it sets up um, what I take to one of the most... Um, baffling, right. interesting, striking endings of any story I've ever read. Yes. Um, with well the, said. When, when, when we finally see him um, dueling with Turnus uh, in, the, in the next episode. Right. And so I, this, this setup of kind of this descent from ci civilization into savagery, I think is so striking and it has to be absolutely deliberate on Virgil's part. Of course. Yeah. yeah. And perfectly executed. Yes. All right, Dave, as we get into the, the beginnings of this book, um, there's this wonderful simile um, right. regarding Turnus. You want to read that and talk yeah, a bit about it? Yeah, I would. So this is the Lombardo translation again. A lion prowling the fields around Carthage is wounded in the chest by hunters and only then wakens to war. Tossing his shaggy mane with joy, he snaps the spear and roars with blood-stained mouth. So too the fury mounting in Turnus. No, I mean, it's beautifully done, right? Mm -hmm. It's, I mean, the English here is almost as nice as the Latin. It's a very good translation. Yes, it is. I like it a lot. But I'm struck by the fact that it's, of course, in the Homeric mold, you have to introduce any significant action with some comparison to the world of nature. Right. This is what a lion does. But it struck me the fact that Carthage is brought up once again. Turnus is like a Carthaginian lion. Yeah. Now, the skeptic might say, well, you know, there was a certain kind of Barbary lion that was native to North Africa in that part. But that's not a significant enough explanation, I don't think. Right. I think the bringing up Carthage again is a way to drive home that eternal wound between uh, Aeneas and Dido. Of and course. Mention it once more. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What Do you have an opinion on whether there were Berber lions in North Africa? Did I say Barbary? What did I say? Barbary, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, but uh, North African lions. Oh, there for sure was. Okay, yeah. There for sure were, yeah. They, right. they went extinct in historical times. I mean, there's those lion hunt scenes from northern Greece too, right? Yes. In, in Pella. Uh, yes, a much smaller lion than the Tarzanian kind. Right. Yeah, you know, from sub-Saharan Africa. <laughs> nice, nice, uh, Thanks. nice callback. <laughs> right. But there definitely were lions yeah. um, that, that lived, and I think maybe even as late as the time of St. Augustine. That's really interesting. I'm, I'm sure there have been, I, I would, do you have, no, have they found like lion bones and skeletal remains? I think they, you, they found the lion dum-dum, actually. <laughs> lion dum-dum? <laughs> where the lions met together in oh, council. Right. Oh, good, I Did forget. you forget the dum-dum yeah, already? I forgot about the dum-dum. Okay. Right. All right, so... Um, did, did you like the simile? I did, I like it. And okay. then I think later on we see Turnus also compared to a bull. Right. right? So yes. Is, right? Also very interesting. Yep. Okay, so Turnus is prowling like a lion on the battlefield. He wants to meet Aeneas in single combat to mm -hmm. end the war once and for all. Right. And right. then what does he say? He says, I'm not waiting. Again, this is a Lombardo's translation. I'm not waiting. There's no need for Aeneas and his cowards 
to recant. I'll meet him in single combat. Draw up the pact, father, and begin the rites. Either this arm pitches the Asian tramp into Tartarus with the Latins watching, and my sword restores our nature's on, nation's honor, or he rules with Lavinia as his bride. Yes. So he's ready to to roll the dice and 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 ha- end this thing once and for all. Yeah. Right. So what do you think about this as a way to resolve international geopolitical conflict? Well, I, I, before I, I get, yes. get into that, um, clearly this is a nod towards the. Um, kind of the interrupted duel between Menelaus and Paris. That's correct. Right? In the Trojan War, it was also decided, enough of this, let's let the principals battle this out for the whole enchilada. And so Menelaus and Paris, but, and then as we'll see, this duel too was interrupted in a similar kind of way. Correct. Right. Menelaus breaks his sword over Paris's helmet. Right. And then you, he was uh, skulking in the back, the third rank back, Paris was. Menelaus, Brendan Gleeson, right, in the Troy movie. Is that who plays him? Yeah, yeah. calls him out. And out Paris comes, of course. Um, what's his name again? Um, Orlando Bloom. Oh, shudder. You're not supposed to shudder. <laughs> uh, this, goes, this goes way, way back to the very beginning um, of our uh, our podcast. Yes, right? that's right, 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 yeah. Um, Any, anyway. And there's that great scene you where... You love that scene where he grabs him by the chin strap. Yes, I love that. He's dragging him. It's, right. It's so vivid. Yes. Yeah. But anyway... Um, I don't have an opinion on whether this is a good way to solve geopolitical conflicts, but clearly you've been thinking about this. Well, I don't have a concluded or settled opinion, but my contrarian point is that we tend to think of ancient um, monarchical societies, warrior cultures, you know, shame cultures, honor cultures as limited, barbaric and so forth. And uh, post-enlightenment democracy is really the way uh, that every nation ought to operate. Yeah. Right, and right. on the whole, I'm obviously very sympathetic to that. However, it strikes me that if you could really get people to agree, you put up the best man from each side, and whoever wins the other side, you know, whom he represents, then rules, and the losers have to submit en masse, yeah. you know, to the former. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm thinking, right, mm-hmm. um, uh, Putin, right, there's a conflict with Putin, and, right, and uh, President Biden is our current president. Yeah. There's, there's conflict all over the world. Right. Think of how much bloodshed and treasure would be saved if we just agreed to put forward, you know, the, the one uh, best individual, right. man or woman, uh, to settle it this way. It could, it could even be like over a, like a, a round of racco. I was saying, yeah, it yeah. doesn't it have, have to be, be blood sport. It doesn't have to be physical, <laughs> right. right? It could be racco. It could be a less complicated game like chess. Yeah. You know, um, it could include both physical and mental Kinds of things. It could be like a decathlon of different Correct. kinds of, of... Throw in some dancing, like Dancing with the Stars, and... Uh, and then you televise it. Correct. Yes. <laughs> and then at the end, you just, okay, so we've all decided so-and-so is the clear victor, mm-hmm. and now that particular nation state is the is the uh, champion in this conflict. Yeah. It has something to recommend it. It does. I think you'd have a, 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 um, a lot of trouble getting people to go along with this. Okay. Especially once they found themselves on the losing side. But so the, the guy, some guy said, I could have played Racco better than than Vice Secretary whoever. Right. right? But <laughs> like the Hunger Games, there would be a selection process. I see. So the person who represents our nation, you know, in the Racco off. Yeah. Would truly be. Like a Racco champion. Exactly. Right, right, right. Yeah. Not just some also ran. Right. You Have you ever watched any Game of Thrones? No. There's, um, there's a recurring thing in that series where. If two people have a, a conflict, right. rather than setting, settling in a court of law, they can either duel it out in the arena, or if you can convince someone to, like, to be your champion, they fight on your oh, behalf. Oh, yeah, of course. Right? So it's a, it's a similar like kind a of thing. Like a mercenary. Yeah, exactly. It's right. the, whole, um, right. the whole rationale behind mercenaries. And then the, your guilt or innocence, is it depends on who wins or loses that fight. It kind of yeah. makes sense to outsource the massive conflict to just a couple of representative individuals. Yeah. Well, I know that I'm... I've, I have no evidence for this, but I feel I'm I'm wary that we have any racco geniuses out there hmm. in, in this land. So I yeah, think or someone gonna... who can ride on a horse shirtless like Putin, <laughs> exactly. right? Right. right. Uh, well, well, beckoning a, f- a falcon to his arm. Is that what he was doing? Something like that. <laughs> we joke, but you know these are serious matters, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Tur- Turnus and Aeneas. This is what they're going to do. Yes. And I think there's something noble about it. Yep. Um, I do too. But um, Amata and Latinus. Uh, they they are not in favor of it right. because they, I think they I think they kind of sense 
that Turnus is not long for this world. No, right? he's not the man Aeneas is. No. So he tries to talk Turnus out of it yep. and uh, suggests maybe a negotiated peace right. with the Trojans instead. Right, but I mean, you don't want to end in a, 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 a Homeric type epic with a negotiated peace. No. No, nobody wants to read that. No, no, but then he uh, <laughs> he has kind of a Priam move, right? Mm -hmm. As in Priam's appeal to Achilles in the Iliad. Yeah. Have some pity on an old man who doesn't want to lose his son. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he, he's trying to stir up those kinds of of, of things. It, That's right. It's um, it's like uh, Phoenix talking to Achilles in the tent, you know, trying right. to kind of re reminding him of his father and, That's right. and his childhood. Yep. But it doesn't work. No. Um, Latinus does have this really interesting line as he's trying to persuade Turnus. He says, you know, I never should have agreed to betroth my daughter to you. There mm. were all of these oracles and so forth that told me otherwise. Yep. But I was overcome by love for you. And our ties of kinship. Yeah. So this affection, this uh, familial um, attachment has led him astray. Yeah. It's caused him to do something contrary to the fates. Right. And I think that now that you bring that up, that's really interesting because I think there's a, um, you know, there's a thread through the Iliad that, you know, ties of kinship uh, transcend, um, you know, being Greek or Trojan or being on one side or the yes. other. And the, remember the, those two guys out on the battlefield who discovered that they're Fathers were guest yeah, friends, and they decided. Glaucon and Diomedes. That's it, and they say we can't fight, right? right. Because we have these ties. Of, so here, um, there's even something greater than ties of kinship, and that's that's, right. that's the fate. National destiny. National de destiny. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Turnus is unmoved, and, and in fact, he even he even um, goes so far as to as to mock Aeneas. Hmm. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. So Turnus um, responds to Latinus says, "For my sake, sire, do nothing for my sake, and permit me to purchase fame with death." I too can throw spears, father, and when I strike, blood flows from the wound. His goddess mother won't be there for him, lurking in mist to hide his womanly flight in a cloud. <laughs> and so it seems like uh, Turnus has heard the Iliad. Yes. Because this is what, one of the things that happens, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, these, these stories are famous mm -hmm. even in their own generation, right. as we saw when Aeneas landed in Carthage. But I guess the story has reached full well throughout Italy. Now, one, one question I do have is, was, how does Turnus know that, that Venus isn't going to be there? I mean, she does show up. She she aids in in healing uh, Aeneas's wound where he's hit with the arrow. But how does he know she's not going to be looking there, and she's not going to carry him out? Does Turnus have kind of a sense that yes, it's coming down to this final moment, and nothing's going to get in the way? Well, I wonder about the promise that Jupiter made that the gods won't interfere, and that was in Book Ten, if I'm not mistaken. The gods will not interfere in this conflict as they did on the plains of Troy. Mm, mm. But how does Turnus, Turnus know? know? Yeah. That's one of those questions you don't you're not, not supposed to ask. Exactly. Right. right. The poet controls the world and you're not really allowed to complain about it. Yeah. Exactly. What about Amada? Doesn't she try to persuade Turnus? She does. It's the same thing. It's in the context of kind of her her um, attempt to persuade Turnus that we get the the simile with Lavinia that we started right. the episode with. And um but and this too, Turnus, I mean he's he seems to be kind of um, you know, frozen for a moment because of his deep love uh, for a Lavinia, as right. the text says, but it's not enough right. for him to, to step aside from this duel. No, I don't yeah. want to ask any uncomfortable questions yes. here of a familial nature. Go ahead. Dr. Winkle. I'm an open book. <laughs> but doesn't Amada have a whole lot more devotion to and affection for her son-in-law than most mothers-in-law <laughs> that I have encountered? <laughs> I think that's true, right. That's a generalization, but there's yeah. is there something to it? Uh, no, I, I, I mean, it, I just, now that you bring it up, it does strike me as kind of rather, rather... Um, it's intense. Strange. It is very intense. Yeah, I'm not right? saying there's anything untoward about it. Yeah. But it it's unusual to me that she has that much attachment to Turnus. I guess she just really, well, she's been addled by a fury... But even before that, did she really believe this is the best man for my daughter? Right. And I want you know no one to take his place. Right. Right. Hmm. She's very attached to him. Right. I, I, this, um, it just it reminds me a little bit of my own situation. Oh, one of the things that my wife, your mother-in-law, loves you she, that much. She does, and one of the things that my wife complains about is right. how I can do no wrong oh, in what my mother-in-law's eyes. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so yeah, I'm not sure. It doesn't. You are the Turnus. It doesn't have the intensity of a modern Turnus, but I, yeah, I, I, there's some things oh, I recognize that. That's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's great. Do yeah. you have any brothers-in-law? Does Becca have any brothers? Uh, she has one brother. Yes, oh, exactly. I feel sorry for that guy. Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's. I mean, he's he, third place. He. I mean, and he's he's far out. Uh, he's out in Oregon, and so okay. he's a. Uh, 
He's on, he's, he's on the periphery in more ways than one. He's the Aeneas. Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. <laughs> right, right. So what, is, uh, what does Amata say to Turnus? Then? Well, she says, she says the, um, uh, the, in Lombardo's words, this one thing I beg of you, do not commit yourself to this combat. Whatever fate awaits you in battle awaits me also. And together with you, I will leave this hateful light before I see Aeneas as my captor and my son. Hmm. Maybe that explains it a little bit. Her fate is inexorably tied to that of Turnus. When Turnus dies, she dies. Yeah. And so maybe it's not so much affection for Turnus, but self-preservation. Yeah. I love this closing line. I will leave this hate for life before I see Aeneas as my captor and my son. Now she does commit suicide. Right. So here yeah. she's um, presaging it. Exactly. Now I was, um, this might be a better discussion for, for next week, but I mean, are there, what are the traditions about Aeneas and Lavinia? after the action of the Aeneid. Um, I'm not aware of any kind of strong kind of mythological or narrative tradition about... Not that I can remember. Did they, I mean, um, it just seems like... It, they moved to Alba Longa. Right. Started playing pickleball, if <laughs> I remember. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Lavinia took up baking and... Um, Macrame. You know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Aeneas would complain a little bit about, you know, how the furniture was arranged. Right. The, the feng shui wasn't, yeah. wasn't working. He'd shuffle out of the house and, you know, ride for hours and... Yeah. The relationship was strained at right. times because, I mean, Lavinia is no Dido, right. much less Creusa, right? Yeah, exactly. And right. He, he would sometime confu sometimes confuse names. You know, he'd inadvertently call her Creusa or Dido. And oh, man. That was obviously very hurtful for Lavinia. Right, right, right. So I'm not sure how she got her revenge. <laughs> yeah. It's just, um, it's just everything seems to presage that this is going to be a disaster. Yes. The relationship is going but to But be. you're looking for, you know, a Victorian kind of relationship. You're looking for, but, you know, true love. But Virgil has already set up in book four about what true passion could be, right? Yeah. But it, it couldn't be. It, could, it, could. It, it failed. <laughs> it failed, but not because of Aeneas or Dido. It failed because of the demands of this faceless fate. And that's what makes it a tragic story. Yeah. What he really wants, he cannot have, right? Yeah. And what she really wants, she can't have. Yes. Because they are representatives of their um, respective nations. Yeah. Just like in that duel between our appointed hero and any other world leader, they got to take one for the team. Right. Right, right, right. It just, it, it's just sets up, the, I mean, it's another reminder to me, kind of this tension between this national epic that is kind of explaining how kind of the, the gods and fate are behind the founding of Rome is also imbued with kind of a non-happy ending. Right. Right. It, there's a darkness about it. And that, that, I mean, that's one of the things I find most that's interesting about it. That's what makes it a good story. That's what makes it a good story. But it, it would seem like at a glance that you would expect that to end on a, on a high note. Yes. Right. Yes. Uh, and it doesn't. Yeah. So here, let me make a point that I think I've made many times in many ways, but it's, it's more clear to me now. I like stories where there is moral and psychological realism, mm -hmm. even if the surface details are fantastical and unbelievable. Okay. So that's the opposite, right? Yes. Of today. Today we have stories. I'm not talking about, um, comic book stories, but we have stories that are more believable and plausible in terms of not divine intervention by 30 different gods and goddesses. Yeah. But they lack, to my mind, they lack um, psychological and moral verity mm. because the characters act in ways that real people don't and can't act. Yes. Does that make sense? It, 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 do you, can you think of, do you have an example like at, on, on the t at the tip of your tongue? I mean, I find that a really interesting idea. And I think you're right. I'm just wondering, do you have like, I just watched this or just read this and I, I saw this. No, no. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I can't think of one. No, right. but to me, the complaint about you know reading Greek epic or Greek tragedy that well, you know, the god intervenes and rescues and the other kinds of niggling sort of um, criticisms. That's not how the world is. Right. They miss the point. Yeah. Because the realism is how people behave and act. Yes. I think I see. I, I think this would be a very superficial example. Okay. This is is if I watch a, like a, a current movie that is set in a high school. Okay. Right. And everything looks like high school. Right. And um, even if the actors and actors maybe look a little bit too old for their role, yes. it, it looks like high school. But I always come away with that's not how teenagers talk and that's not how they act. That's not how they think. Right. right. It's not what they desire. It's right. not what they prioritize. It's not where they're headed. It always feels so false. That's a good example. Okay. So yeah. there, a lot of time is spent on fooling the eye, you might say. Yes. With secondary kinds of considerations. Right, right, right. And maybe this is why the starkness of, say, the Athenian stage 
is so appealing. Yeah. Because there wasn't time spent on elaborate setting and staging and so forth. Right. And and interestingly enough is when they did devote uh, time to that, it was kind of, the, it was when everything was kind of falling apart. Yeah. The audience right? didn't really care. Didn't care. About right. It. What was so real was the way that people behaved as, you know, conveyed in the dialogue. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, Jeff, we're coming up on the arming scene, are yes, we not? Yes, another classic uh, Homeric archetype. That's correct. And so, Turnus is, again, he's wasting no time. He's getting ready for this fight. He has, seems to have a kind of death wish. He wants his name to be to be made, um, whether that's, you know, in the ground or, or, or standing above it. And so, he goes out and he um, uh, he gets all his armor together. And then he has this nice little speech that he gives to yes. his spear. Right. Right. And I'm, we've got some Latin here. You want to read some Latin? I would. And speaking of Latin, yes. I would like to mention that um, for teaching of Latin, the noun arma, right? Arma armorum. It's a neuter collective. It means weapons. Mm -hmm. I have to typically encourage students not to translate it as arms because that's not really used so much anymore no. as a word for weapons. That's true. And it leads them into some odd combinations. For example, they were carrying their arms on their shoulders. <laughs> No, 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 right. You want to say weapons. Yes, exactly. Anyway. Yeah, okay. Wokiferans hunk o numquam frustrata vocatus, hasta meos nunc tempus adest te maximus actor, te turni nunc dextra gerit da stenera corpus, lordri cam quem anu valida lacarara revulsam, semi veri frigeset foi darrin pura crinus, vibratos calido ferdro muraque madentis. Nicely done. Thank you. I, I like the I like the conceit of addressing an inanimate object. And, I do too. Talking, it's it's a the, the spear has a personality. It's yes. kind of like BB King with his guitar, Lucille. That's right. right? And so uh, there's something kind of uh, uh, cool about. This. Absolutely. I have to make a correction. Yeah. It's Madentis. Madentis. It's Madentis. It's long, but in the the um, penultimate line that I read, we have semi weary frigus, the Phrygian half man. Right. <laughs> That's awesome. The Phrygian Halfman, which I believe uh, Lombardo translates as eunuch. Eunuch, right. yeah, exactly. Do you want to read the translation? Sure. Uh, spear that has never failed my call. The hour has come. Actor once bore you mightily, and now you are in the hand of Turnus. Grant, grant that I lay the Phrygian eunuch out on the ground, rip away his corselet, and grind into dirt his pretty hair, crisp with curling irons and dripping with myrrh. More hair? More hair. <laughs> I love this. And so he's, I mean, he is... Um, He's using a kind of uh, feminizing yes. language to insult Aeneas. Yeah, the Eastern dandy. Yeah. It goes all the way back to, of course, the Iliad. Right. Uh, and then it reappears in Herodotus. Yes. It, it was a common trope. Yep. Um, so the episode that you named, All's Hair in Love and War. I remember it. That, that's proven to be quite successful. However, if I may say with some umbrage. Yes. The one that I named. Yeah. Male Pattern Baldrick. One of my favorites. That's funny. It is very funny. That's a dog in terms of downloads. It, it's not because of the title. Are you, are you sure? That, that, that title is gold. Maybe people didn't know <laughs> what to do with it. Male Pattern Baldrick. What is that? I, I love it. I thought it was on point. It's very on point. It's in my top five. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, speaking of downloads. Yes. You keep waiting for me to go to the ads, but I'm not doing it. Okay. Well, all right. Uh, we, we recently um, passed 90,000. Fantastic. We have uh, 90,000 separate downloads of our 120 odd episodes. Maybe when we get to 100,000, we could do some kind of giveaway. I think we should do that. Yeah. Give away the farm. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Speaking of giving away the farm. Yes. It's time for the ads. Finally. This episode of Odd Nauseam is brought to you by Ratio Coffee. Uh, Dave, I believe you've got a review that yes, you want to share? Yes, I do. Yes, this was written by one Daniel Modlin in a Weird Magazine. Wire, wired. Sorry, Wired. Right. There was a Weird Magazine. No. Yes, there was. It was like, really? like, like Sci-Fi Tales. Didn't know that. Yeah, okay. But hmm. So this, this is Wired. Wired Magazine, yeah. August 18, 2020. Mr. Modlin writes, perfection in a Chemex is hard to come by. Chemex? Chemex is a way of brewing coffee, okay. Jeff. I'll just stay with us here, right, please. Sorry. Okay. Is not something I or my friend have been able to do well consistently. I've tried to be as finicky as they come, but ultimately I've convinced myself that part of the beauty of the Chemex method comes from the rarity of success. Hmm. That's hogwash. Come on. <laughs> it's like baseball. If it works a third of the time, then that's pretty remarkable. Okay. When you fail, you still end up with drinkable coffee, although that's somewhat debatable. At times... It can be so oily that the coffee can stick to your tongue throughout the rest of the day, Ugh. or it can even taste like a cup of Mr. Coffee, no. which is drinkable but disappointing, considering the amount of effort put in. 
I continued on, though, convincing myself that I was learning something by using the Chemex, that's the pour-over method, mm -hmm. about what I did wrong with every brew. But at a certain point, I accepted that my technique wasn't improving. Too mm -hmm. many variables, not enough consonant, no, constants. I would say too many mathematical metaphors. <laughs> Instead of searching for a solution, I resigned myself to settling down to a lifetime of imperfect Chemex batches and wasted artisanal coffee beans. Then I saw a coffee maker that could make consistently delicious Chemex style pour over staring at me from across the room. So for, for Daniel, the, at some point, the heavens opened yes. and a ray of light descended upon a, a ratio six a or ratio eight. eight. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's quite an interesting review. It is. Not, not badly written, that's it some, seems to some me. Some purple prose there. There you go. So the ratio eight is staring at him from across the room, Beckoning just like him. it does for you. And you would say about the ratio eight? Oh, I... What I love it. I used it. Th I used it this morning, as I use it almost every morning. If I'm home, I'm using the ratio. That's right. Right. And so I use. I get the. I get the water poured in the night before. I get my my glass. My hand blown glass carafe waiting. Borosilicate. Yes, I have my metal um, cone right. in there waiting. And then, oh, you're not using paper anymore. No, no. I you graduated. I up upgraded to it. And I love it. Yes. yes. Um, that's a game changer. It is really. And then I, I put the grounds in in the morning. Hit that button, and then there's bloom. There's brew. There's ready. And um, you're set to go. You're set to go. It's Can I ask, what do you do with your old grounds? Um, I, I put, my wife is a composter. Yeah, so am I. Yeah. And so we put them in the composter. Okay. Yeah. Um, how large is the pile of um, uncomposted grounds behind your house? It's it's disturbingly large. It's massive, isn't it? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> pyramidal, you would say? Yes, exactly. Okay. Same for you? Yes, pyramidal. <laughs> Starting to block the view of the neighbors. Yeah. So let's say one of our avid listeners says to himself or herself, I would like to up my coffee game. What, what should they do? And have a, a similar experience to Mr. Maudlin here. That's right. Uh, they should go to ratiocoffee.com. Okay. R-A-T-I-O coffee.com. They, uh, they should find the machine they want, or the Ratio 6 or the, the Bigger Brother Ratio 8. In a, in a wide variety of finishes. Yes. All handmade in Portland, Oregon. Yep. Um, beautiful works of art these things are. And then in the coupon code box, they should type in uh, A N C O. 3F. Yes. What does that F stand F. for? Is that flavor? I, I think the F stands for flavor. Yes. Flavonoidinal. Yes. Something like that. So A-N-C-O-3-F and Dave, that will get them. 15% off and the opportunity to support this podcast. Which is priceless. Thank you. This episode of Ad Nauseum is also brought to you by the good people at Hackett Publishing. With offices in Cambridge, Massachusetts and Indianapolis, Indiana, Hackett has been bringing high quality translations to a mass audience inexpensively for many, many years. Yes. And listeners, if you um, have been uh, listening to these Aeneid episodes, you have heard us uh, almost every one of these gushing over Mr. Stanley Lombardo's translation of the Aeneid. Yes. Um, and it, it's, it, it's wonderful. You can find that at Hackett Publishing, along with an, uh, many other of Mr. Lombardo's translations. Yes. Two well. T's in Hackett. Yes. And so if you want to pick that up, um, which I highly recommend, or many of the other Hackett volumes we have referenced um, in many other episodes or, you know, from if, if you want to get outside of classics, you know, philosophy, right. um, Islamic studies, Asian uh, studies, Asian South stu American studies, historiography from kind of all uh, 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 eras of human history, you're going to find it at Hackett. So, uh, yes. I would like to read a little something here yeah, that please. I didn't write. I went back to chat GPT <laughs> and I asked them, oh, why is Hackett Publishing so good? And this is what they said. Okay. Hackett Publishing is known for publishing high-quality translations and scholarly editions of classical works in philosophy, literature, and the humanities. So far, pretty good, right? Yeah. The company was founded in 1972 by philosopher and classicist Roger Hackett and has since become a leading publisher of works in the Western philosophical tradition with a focus on ancient Greek and Roman philosophy, medieval philosophy, and the Enlightenment. Now, I don't know if this is so good because I don't know if there ever was a Roger Hackett. <laughs> you know, there's a problem with these. They're called hallucinations. Yeah. Uh, the, these um, AI bots, they can hallucinate. So I once asked them, um, what is the website Latin per diem? Just out of vain curiosity. Yes. And they said it was founded by former papal Latinist um, Reginald Foster and Daniel Gallagher. Wow. Yeah. That was really interesting Man. news to me. Yeah, exactly. Wow. I tried that in a couple of variations. I kept getting a different person who was behind it. Just so, just hallucinating. Yeah, uh, making sub, making up some of the facts. Interesting. So there might not actually be a Mr. I don't Hackett know if there's here. a Roger Hackett. Okay. It sounds a little made up. I'm it, surprised it didn't say Roger Staubach there. 
<laughs> something like that. The quarterback, right. right. But the the rest of it, very, very accurate. Right? Yeah, interesting. Hackett's additions to continue are known for their accuracy and fidelity to the original texts, mm-hmm. as well as their affordability and accessibility to students and general readers. Wow, it's almost like the, the AI has been listening to this podcast. Exactly. I hope so for yeah. its sake. Wow. So let's say that the avid listener mm-hmm. wants to get some good summer reading. Yes. Read some of those things maybe they've never read. People yeah. talk about Plato's Republic, but have they read it? Right. Here's what they can do. Yeah, and especially if you don't want to give your money to that massive corporation that's threatening to take over the world, you know, that Nile Rivery what corporation. Now? What now? You know what I'm talking about. Go to hackettpublishing.com. That's H-A-C-K-E-T-T publishing.com. Find the books you want. Drop them in the little satchel. And what's our coupon code for this one? AN2023. AN2023. And that will get you 20% off your entire order and free shipping. You can't miss. Check it out. All right, Jeff, as we get back into things, we have here another epic simile. Now Turnus is not being compared to the Carthaginian lion. He's being compared to a rampaging bull. That's right. And I'd like to read these four lines from Lombardo here. He says, when a bull prepares to fight, he bellows horrifically and concentrating his anger in his horns, charges a tree trunk and spars with the wind or scatters sand with his hooves. Hmm. The raging bull. The raging bull, yeah. This doesn't bode well for Turnus's final destiny. No, it does not. When he is compared to violent animals who will eventually be hunted and killed. Exactly. And and in this case, you know, a bull that's uh, not even uh, charging the um, uh, the The opponent. opponent, Right. It's kind of, it's like uh, Don Quixote. charging a tree. He's tilting at windmills, right? Exactly. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, The bull is a little off balance, it seems to me. Yeah, I think you're right. This this, um, predicts what ultimately Mm -hmm. is going to happen. This is called for bullying, if I'm not mistaken. (laughs) That's the term, right? (laughs) <laughs> and so now the uh, the narrative switches over to Aeneas. Okay. We've gotten a lot of Turnus here. Right. And how does Aeneas, how is Aeneas feeling about this? And I'll pick it up here with more Lombardo. Aeneas too was like this, a fierce presence in the armor his mother had given him. He wetted his soul for war and he fanned his anger, glad that the war would be settled and the terms offered. Then he comforted his comrades in Eulis, who was sad and afraid, reminding them of his destiny, and he ordered that a firm and clear response be conveyed to King Latinus, declaring the terms of peace. Hmm. So now this, this is what I was saying at the beginning, is that, okay, um, Aeneas is prepared to do what he needs to do on the battlefield, but he's not just thinking about kind of his white-hot hatred for Turnus, no. right? It's, no. The, he, he recognizes there's a lot more at stake here. And he's still self-controlled. He's self-controlled. He's, he's still he, calm. He's accepting his destiny, and he recognizes that there's a lot more... Uh, to come that he needs to, to, okay. to take care of. And so I, I thought this it, um, might be an interesting way to think about the narrative. Is So if the audience is meant to be thinking about the Iliad, which I right. think we are in many, of many, course. many turns, right? So at, at this point now, we have Turnus is more like Achilles at the end of the Iliad. Raging. He's raging, right? And Aeneas is now, he's more like a Hector. He's more civilized um, um, and he's, he's more circumspect about everything, Correct. right? And so it would seem that just from kind of a connect the dots yes. narrative point, it would mean, okay, Aeneas' time is up. In the same way that Hector expired. Exactly. But of course, we know that's not true. Right. Um, but uh, you know, from a looking at kind of that dualistic, you know, nature versus civilization point of view, this would also seem to be kind of setting up a triumph of civilization over savagery. Like, you know, the the Lapis and the Centaurs. Very right? interesting. Right. And so it, I think that's one of the ways that Virgil's is kind of keeping the audience in kind of that knife edge. Like, where is this going? Very nice. Right. Uh, to add to that, maybe not to add to it, but just develop it, is I think one of the themes, if not the dominant theme of the Iliad, is the contest between nature and nurture. Achilles is naturally the better man. Mm-hmm. Agamemnon is the better man by convention. Right. Yes, by exactly. politics. And this enrages Achilles. Yes. Why can't the natural lion, right, to use Platonic and Nietzschean terms, yes. why can't the natural lion just rule and be at the top of the food chain exactly. where he belongs? Yeah. No, he's got to submit to Agamemnon. Right. So what what's going on here then in the um, Aeneid is that Aeneas is the force of culture, and he's not here enraged. Right, exactly. Which makes it all the more striking when we get to the, the middle of this book is when uh, Aeneas starts to shed a lot yes, of that. Right. And I think that's that's really, sh- it, it's shocking. And it makes the, and the audience wonder, okay, where exactly this is going? And what is and what does this ultimately mean? Right. Yeah. I just have to mention these three lines here from Lombardo. Mm-hmm. This is what uh, critics call formulaic. 
language, right? And they don't like formulae for some crazy reason. They're not watching the Three Stooges. But this is a beautiful translation. Okay. Dawn scattered radiance on the mountaintops as the horses of the sun rose from the sea, breathing light from flared nostrils. Ooh. That's really That well is done. really nice. That is yeah, nice. That, that's English made to sound beautiful. Yeah. Uh, to which it is not naturally susceptible, I would say. Yeah, fantastic. That's great. So, Jeff, where are we going next? Well, okay, so then it's, it seems like this duel is going to happen. Uh, the Rutulians and their allies and the Trojans and their allies, they clear a space before the walls of the city. What, what kinds of things are they clearing out of the way? Oh, they've they got, they got, you know, the big dust brooms. There's okay. a, lot of, a lot of... Um, Some old cars are parked there that cars don't are belong. Parked, fast food bags. Right. Yeah, a lot of litter. They, you, if you're going to have a duel, you want a nice, tight nice space. Nice, clean space. <laughs> That's right, exactly. Okay. Yeah. And so, uh, and everybody's watching. You know, um, all the, of course, the soldiers, people on, right. on the walls. And even we learn... That Juno really? is sitting on a nearby hill watching this. She just likes a good fight, or what's her interest? Well, she, I mean, as as we've seen all along, is that you know Juno knows what ultimately has to happen. Yeah. But she says, okay, if I can't if I can't write the end, I'm going to mess up the middle yes. as much as as possible. So mm -hmm. she's going to she's continuing kind of throwing these monkey wrenches into the works here. And she speaks here to Juturna, yep. who is the sister of Turnus. Right. And Juturna is a nymph. Right. She's a, a, a river, a minor river right. goddess. Or... And what does she say? She says to Juturna, nymph, glory of rivers, my heart's delight. You know how I've given you preference over all the Latin girls who have climbed into Job's thankless bed. You alone I have gladly given a place in heaven. Learn now, Juturna, your sorrow and do not blame me. While fortune seemed to allow it and fates permitted Latium to prosper, I protected Turnus and your city. Now I see him facing a destiny he does not deserve. His doom is upon him, and the fatal stroke is near. I cannot look upon this ordained combat. If you dare to help your brother now, go on. It becomes you. It may still be that better fortune will befall the damned. At this, Juturna wept profusely, and three times, four times her hand beat her lovely breast. But Juno cried, there is no time for tears. Hurry, and if there is any way at all, save your brother from death. Or renew the war and strike the treaty from their hands. I, Juno, order you to dare. Hmm. That's a really interesting speech. It is. Starts out by saying, I actually like you, despite the fact you have cheated with my husband. Right? <laughs> right, right. I actually like you. You alone I have gladly given a place in heaven. I protected your brother. He doesn't deserve his destiny. But now, don't blame me and do me this favor. Right. I don't think she don't actually does like her. I think he, she, I don't think she's so either. using her. Exactly. Right? Highly manipulative. She's a, she is a, simply a means to kind of a, a, right. a jaded end here. Yes. Yeah. And so, um, so yeah, she's, I think, you know, Juno has in some ways has kind of accepted her, the fate, but she says, well, you know, as long as I can put it off, I'm going to put it off. Right. And we've talked about kind of that, that, you know, the rule of oracles and oracle must come true. Right. But what happens between point A and in point, point, a and point B is often up for grabs. It's like one of those novels that I enjoyed as a kid, and you probably did as well, the Choose Your Own Adventure. Oh, yeah. Turn to page, such and such. And Were you one of those kids that turned to those pages and read through all the alternate endings, or did you accept the fantasy and read through it as instructed? Um, I think I tried to do the former, but probably was more of the of the... Or the, the latter, and, and but was more of the former. So like, you I, tried to just follow instructions, I tried so to, you would maintain the the guise of plausibility, and therefore enjoy it more. Right. But, but you ended I up taking it, shortcuts. Give, give any and kind of flipping through it. Right. I remember there was there was one maddening book where there was like a um, um if you opened it right to the middle there was this large picture of kind of this this idealized city that was called Utopia. Okay. And But the, no choice you ever made would get you there. <laughs> and that drove me crazy. It's yeah. like those mazes on the uh, the Denny's menu, right? Once you go in, there's no way out. No, exactly. It's Hotel California. There's no pile of pancakes at the end. <laughs> no. You just keep going. <laughs> going right. uh, so, but I wonder, I wonder if, if it's similar here to what Juno was doing. Every choose your own ending endings um, results in the establishment of Aeneas as king of Italy mm. and his marriage to Lavinia. Yes. But you get to take many uh, byways on the way. Exactly. Right. That's where, in some ways, that's where the really interesting stuff happens. Right. And so Juno recognizes that. And so she says, I'm going to, you know, she's, she wants to keep Turnus alive, of course, for the sake of keeping Turnus alive. Um, but she also wants to make, uh, if Aeneas is going to get this, this, this lauded fate, she is going to make him pay for right. dearly. And but Aeneas is a pious individual. Oh, as we've seen. As, yes. As I've complained about how uh, he you, sacrifices. You're about to complain him. again. <laughs> Here he offers a very civilized prayer. Yes. Does the civilized Aeneas. Shall I read it? Yeah, please do. I call to witness the sun and this land for which I have endured many trials. 
and the Father Almighty, and you his consort, Saturnia, that's Juno, kinder at last now, goddess, I pray, and Mars in his glory, father of all war, and I call upon the springs and rivers, and the powers of the air, and the blue sea, if victory falls to Turnus the Ausonian, the vanquished will withdraw to Evander's city. Eulus shall leave this land, and Aeneas's sons will never return to renew this war, or challenge this realm with the sword. But if victory grants that we win the field, as I think shall be, and may the gods so confirm, I will not demand that Italians be subject to Teucrians, nor seek dominion for myself. Let both nations unconquered commit to everlasting peace under equal laws. I will ordain rites and gods. Latinus, my father-in-law, will retain command. Authority will remain with my father-in-law. For me, the Teucrians will raise my city walls, and Lavinia will give the town her name. That, those are that's a, uh, I mean not just extraordinary lines that's, that's an extraordinary sentiment. It is. He's saying like even if I win, I'm not I'm not taking over. Correct. I will step aside and allow the people who are already ruling to keep ruling. You see, the Romans are a just and fair people. Yes. They didn't just run roughshod over everyone. The Pax Augusta is a good thing for everybody. And this is this also you know Caesar, I'm not I'm saying that with some facetiousness. Right, you right, understand, right? Of course, but I mean Caesar's uh, Clementia here as exactly. Well, right? You know, um, well. It's what it is. It's his Clementia. As long as you're loyal to, to Rome, we'll let you more or less kind of keep on as you've been keeping on. Yeah, not the we, though, in that instance. The I, right? Yes. Caesar, and this is what I think, I'm glad you brought this up, this is what made all of his contemporaries so angry. A citizen cannot grant forgiveness to another citizen mm. who doesn't need it. Right. I haven't given you some kind of civil pardon right? because I don't have authority over right, you. Right, 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 right. Yeah, exactly. And I think this is probably what makes Turnus so angry. Sure. The, right. the clemency is hollow. Yeah. But from that kind of that point of view of kind of civilization and, and savagery, you notice how Aeneas is even, he's even kind of, he's in his prayer, he's kind of nodding towards Juno. He's right. Like, I, you seem kinder. I hope you're kinder now. He's trying to make peace with everybody. Right. Anybody, I, he's also kind of thinking not really about the duel right now. He's thinking about everything kind of after the duel. I mean, in some ways, I think that you know, Aeneas has accepted um, that fate is on his side. He's, start, mm -hmm. he's starting to kind of see that. He's starting to smell it. So when he well, says... it's book 12. It's about time. <laughs> it's about time. But he says, you know, if victory falls to Turnus the Estonian, he knows that's not going to happen. So right. it's, it's kind of an easy thing for him to say. But That's it, true. But he comes off as very, uh, um, you know, um, on the level. Correct. He's saying, if I lose here... We're gonna, you know, either you know, go to we'll we'll back off to live with a Vander, right? Or we'll we'll leave entirely, right? You have, no, you have nothing to worry about. Nothing to worry so about. This is so strikingly different than kind of the the what gnashing of next? the gnashing of teeth that that we see from Turnus, and certainly uh, with comparison right. to what comes next. Yes. But then, as they come forward on the plane, the Rutulians, that is the supporters of Turnus, they start to panic a little bit, mm -hmm. right? And why do they do that? Because they see, oh, it's obvious who the who the better man is right. here. And so now they're saying, well, we put all our, our, our chips with this guy. Right. And, um, and so they're starting to kind of to freak out. And that's when Juturna, uh, you know, following Juno's lead, um, she disguises herself um, as one of their own and starts moving amongst the uh, Rutulian army and, and kind of just shames them into action. Yes. That's a very kind of Homeric type of thing. Absolutely. It's like Odysseus, you know, after they're, they're freaking out and running for the ships early on, he shames them back to the battlefield. Yeah, and right? beats Thersites as an example. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there's a um, a bird sign, a very Romany bird sign. We haven't had there. a bird in a long time. No, I think this is the one in which the eagle comes down and snatches a goose. Yes. And then what do the rest of the gooses do? The, I, they um, rise up and they uh, beat that, the eagle. That's right. That's right. And they so, take back their wounded comrade. And so they say, "Oh, that, now that's a sign that seems right. to be on our side." Yes, I don't know right. exactly how, but <laughs> right. <laughs> my uh, augury is not so good. Right. Right. Uh, but the Rutulians take this as okay. Okay. Uh, the gods are on our side, and so their 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 knees get much less weak in that moment. And then the whole thing breaks up. How? Well, we have kind of Tolumnius. Tolumnius. He's kind of our our Pandarus uh, okay. character from the Iliad. He's uh, to start the battle. To start the battle. So remember, in the Iliad, it's uh, Pandarus who shoots the arrow. Right. That breaks up the duel, and the war gets you know gets going. And here it's uh, Tolumnius. He throws his spear. And that's when all of Hades breaks loose, yes. and it's full-on war once again. Would you like me to read a little bit of the Latin there, if I may? I would. Lines 288 and following. Mm -hmm. Mesa pus regem regis quin signe gerentem, tirre now les stain abodus confundur refoitus, adware so proteret equo rubatilla brocadanes, et misera positis aturgin walbiter ardris, in caput in cumeros at fairwidus, adwell at hosta, Mesapus te lo quorantem multa, tra, multa trabali, de super altus a quo gravater fert at quita fa tur. 
So I would, I mean, I would argue that Jeff, it, what, what you always say, nicely done, nicely done. Oh, of course, that, it doesn't that go without saying. Yeah, now. but I like okay, it. I will say it. That was that was wonderfully. Thank read, you. Read. I appreciate that. So um, I, I was I, real hurt in my voice I, there. I, I hear it, and I apologize. <laughs> um, so I would argue here that, and, and I think our, Virgil is showing us as the war kind of go blazes back up. It's at least at this point that it's the Vertulian side that is acting kind of uncivilized. And yes. Really following kind of you know, the code of, of war such as, the, as it is. And Whereas so, Aeneas, as we'll see, he's still hewing to the line of order and decency. Right. He's still trying to kind of call people back to, to reason and, right. to, and to calm. So the translation of, of those lines. Um, uh, Mesopis in his zeal to overturn the truce in Etruscan. This man, a king, and wearing a king's insignia, backed away, tripped and fell and head, head and shoulders onto an altar behind him. Mesopis was over him in a flash, spear in hand, and although Aulestes, poor wretch, pleaded long, came down hard on him with his beam of a spear and said, he's had it, one of our beggar victims for the great god. So it's not just killing the enemy of the battle, they're killing him on an altar yeah. and using kind of the language of human sacrifice. Yeah, so right? the killing on the altar takes us back to book two, right? There's the parallelism where uh, Priam is killed by Pyrrhus at the altar yes. in the burning city of Troy. Yes, exactly. There's the correspondence. Right. Um, and then just a little bit more. Uh, the Italians crowded around and stripped the body while it was still warm. You got to let the body cool. It, you gotta, before you strip it. You yeah. don't take his Air Jordans while the body's still <laughs> warm or the Rolex. You got to let it go to room temperature. Exactly. At, at least, right. So I th- Savage. Se- very savage, right. And so in, even in the midst of this, Aeneas is still calling for order. Mm. Um, again, Lombardo. but Bang, sed- Banging his gavel, you might say. Yes, exactly. Uh, to no avail. But steadfast Aeneas, head bare, stood stretching out his unarmed hand. And calling in a loud voice to his men, where are you going? What is this sudden surge of strife? Hold in your rage. Cohibita iras is the Latin. Um, The truce has already been struck in terms set. I alone have the right to fight. Let me do it. Forget your fears. This hand will make the treaty true. These rights have already given Turnus. Uh, these rights have already given Turnus to me. Hmm. Boy, you're getting quite animated. Oh, this, there. this is great stuff. This is this right. is uh, hitting a, a chord with you. Yeah, striking no, I, a chord. I really, really in, in, enjoyed this, and it's right at that moment. Zip, zip, and right. an arrow comes out of nowhere and hits him in the leg. Ah. Uh, and I like that Virgil. Kind of, he, he 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 mentions this that no, we don't know who shot it. Right. And uh, we don't know if it was guided by a god. Yeah. It's just it's kept mysterious. Huh. Um, but it's kind of came sh- from the bow of Apollo, maybe something like that. Um, but it shuts Aeneas up, and he's wounded um, badly enough that he has to be taken mm. uh, to the to the medical tent. Mm-hmm. This gives Turnus an opportunity for an Aristea. Yeah, he goes on a, a rampage, right, killing Eumenes, the son of Dolon, right, mm-hmm. and then has this speech where he's braying about his his uh, his conquest. Yes. Take a good look, Trojan, at these fields, the Hesperia you came to conquer in war. Lie there and measure out every acre. This is the reward for those who try me with a sword. And this is how they build their city walls. Right. Right. Now, and so to, to uh, I think the, the mention of, of Dolan's son deliberately takes us back to the Iliad. That's right. And then and just in terms of that constant kind of back and forth, okay, who's mapping onto Achilles? Who's mapping onto Hector here? With Aeneas being withdrawn from the war, and when he, when he leaves the, the um, Rutulian surge, that reminds me very much of Achilles going to his tent. That's when right. The, so now in that, in, in, through that lens, Aeneas is now our Achilles, where he right. was just our Hector. Right. So it's just constantly kind of pulling us back and forth, which I find so intriguing and wonderful. Hmm. You, the intriguing part I get, but someone might say, this is not wonderful. Play to type. Let us figure out, you know, who's who here. For whom do I cheer? Because you're starting to verge toward the revisionist interpretation of the Aeneid. That Aeneid is not the true hero. He's more complicated. Well, he's, I don't think it's to be, you, it doesn't be revisionist to say that he's complicated. Well, I mean, is he uh, celebrating Augustus and his regime? Is that what Virgil is doing? Yes. According to the ancients, he had two purposes, right? Imitate and outdo Homer uh-huh. and celebrate Augustus. Right. If Aeneas is too complicated, it's not a celebration of the Augustan victory. I mean, I will stand by the fact, I don't, and I don't think it's revisionist, is that it's not as clear cut as that. It's okay. not that simple, right? I think there is there's so much here that you I think you can obviously read as a critique as much as a celebration. Okay, right? But that is uh, the re- I mean that's that is kind of the revisionist position. I think it's the I think it's the better reading. All right, all right. Well, uh, we'll get more into that as we <laughs> as we wrap up. Do we have time to talk about Mr. Miyagi? Um, you've got the clock in front of you. Where yeah, are we? we're getting up against it. Okay, but we could talk a little bit about Mr. Miyagi. All right, so Aeneas is just brought- to wrap up this. You know this part where he's got the wound in his leg, right? So he goes, he goes back to the tent, and, and a certain um, uh, Yapix is called for. He's the healer, 
And we, we learned that he's beloved of Apollo. And of course, mm -hmm. Apollo's son is Asclepius. He has you know, a connection with, with not only just healing, but of course, arrows. So he's got the right? lab coat. And yeah. He's got that, you know, the bottom of an orange juice can on his forehead. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So he comes wandering and he's got all his potions and all his, his herbs. But right. everything that he he um, he puts forward onto him, it doesn't it doesn't work. Nothing works. Um, but this this kind of this the, this moment struck me as, as kind of archetypal. Do you try any Windex like the guy in oh, and Big, Big Fat Greek Wedding? He should have had that in, like in a holster or something, right? But it did remind me of uh, that moment from the Karate Kid. You mentioned right. Mr. Miyagi is where Dan Le Daniel LaRusso, it looks like he's out of the tournament. Is Daniel LaRusso the Ralph Macchio character? Yes, right. Okay. He's, he's our, I didn't know his name. He's the, he's the hero. And he's up against Johnny Lawrence. It's the, it's the, it's, the guy's name is Johnny Lawrence? It is. <laughs> the, he's, the, he's the blonde villain. Right. right? Uh, Cobra Kai. And they're on the mat. It's the climactic match. Okay. And, uh, Johnny has swept the leg. So he's injured. He's injured. He can barely stand up. Yeah. And so they take him back to the locker room. And and the, the referees kind of tell them, hey, you, we got to make a decision here. Right. And um, throw, throw the match, throw, right? Throw the match. Get you're, back in or give you're Give up done. there. And Mr. Miyagi is starting to tell Daniel, you know, the, you, you've come this far. Nobody expected this. That There's no shame in, in bowing out. Right. But Daniel begs for help. And that's where Mr. Miyagi claps his head together. And rubs them. Okay. And then he puts them onto the wound. And this, this is, some this is of, the same guy that made burgers and fries on Happy Days? <laughs> exactly. Right. Arnold. Right, okay. right, right. So he applies some kind of you know, ancient Okinawan wow. um, you know, uh, uh, Magic. He healing art. Yeah. Right. And by pu putting his warmed up hands on Daniel's wound. Some, someone told him to put the balm on. Exactly. I, uh, who gave him a balm? <laughs> about a balm. And that makes him well enough to limp back out there. And, and, win. and then finally use the crane kick to, the crane. to win the whole thing. So, huh. right, so, so Aeneas is out there and needs special help. And this is where Yapix shows with, up. Then with an assist from Venus, okay. who goes to Crete, grabs some magic herb. That's fast. Slips it into Yapix's pocket wow. and kind of taps him and says, hey, use this. It was a dittany? Is that what the herb was? Yes, right. right. And then when he uses it. She's, she got to Crete and back. And oh, that, goddesses can move quick. That's incredible. And what happens is once he applies the dittany, the arrow falls out and it's immediately wounded. Uh, the wound is healed. Right. And now it's like, hey, it's time to get back out there. Mm. Right. So you apply the dittany mm -hmm. and then the litany of your woes dissipates. <laughs> that's, that's right. Exactly right. Incredible. Yeah. Now he's healed and he's ready to jump back into action. Right. And we're very close to the point where I think it starts to, he starts to kind of shed his civilized nature and he's kind of going to, he's going towards the, the era. He's going towards the main and the anger, the rage. Well, that seems like a good place for us to, um, off ramp from this particular episode. I would agree. All right. You like how I made a noun into a verb there? I did. I always like the off ramp something. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. You notice how people are saying surface? Sur are they? They're using what? it as a verb all the time. It used to be restricted to submarines, but now they're using it for concerns and interests. Could you, could you just surface those interests a little more? I haven't heard that. You haven't heard that? No, that Good for you. That's maddening. It's terrible. Exactly. Right. <laughs> so I, I, I mean, I hate it when people, let, let's table that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. No it's, good. Not, it's not going to end. No, it's not going to end. Mm -hmm. But well, Okay, we can't go down that black, no. that dark hole, all right? But we have mentioned many of the things that bother us. We have. And so it's been a successful episode. <laughs> I agree. We need to thank some people. We do. But before we thank some people, you want to tell us a little bit about the Moss Method? Well, you know, uh, yesterday the smash sale ended. And oh. it was quite successful. We got some good response. Fantastic. offered 20% off. Oh, man. On the Moss Method for Greek, self-paced, expert, and accessible. And uh, the Lingua Latina Per Se Illustrata course that I offer. Um, some people took advantage of that so that they could, um, you know, launch into the world of studying Greek and Latin for the summer. It was a good idea. Fantastic. But if you want to master these languages, you know, it's not going to come quickly, uh, but it's not painful. It's actually delightful. And you can have me as your psychopompos, your soul guide. Nice. Uh, to take you through this. So go to mossmethod.com. Check out our program. You can watch a sample lesson. Or go to latinperdiem.com slash LLPSI if you want to study Latin. Lots of free stuff in both places to check out. Right? Exactly. We're sample. almost yep. up to 2,000 free lessons on my YouTube channel. Fantastic. Which is, uh, you know, represents a lot of work and uh, I'm, I'm proud of it. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to have been able to do that. Very cool. And as I've said before, it may not be the best program, but I am pretty confident it is the best value in terms of combination of expertise, guidance, and uh, the cost. It's a good value. Well said. Check it out, people. And we need to thank some folks. Yes. We, we uh, want to thank Mishka, our sound engineer. Yep. Yeah, all for the wonderful work that she does and how quick uh, of a turnaround she gives us each and every time. Thanks to Scott Vincent and Ken, and Ken Tamplin uh, for the great music. Although I admit this week I kind of missed the Tarzan yell. You did. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny because I, I missed the standard uh, 
intro music. You did. It okay. seemed something was a little bit off. Okay. So. okay. All right. Well, we're, we're back to... We're back at it. We're with back the at bumper it. music. And uh, you can check out Scott Van Zen. You uh, can participate in his online guitar lessons. Guy's amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, or can learn how to sing like nobody else. Yep. yep. Check out his vocal academy. And if you want to write to us, if you want to, uh, with an idea for an episode, a question, a complaint. Yes. If you want a shout out, we need, we need some shout outs. That's right. Um, write to Jeff at adnauseum.com. Don't forget the V. Or write to Dave at Dave at adnauseum.com. Again, do not forget that V. On our website, you can go to the Lurch with Merch section. Pick yep. yourself up a hat or a t-shirt with some nice Latin uh, slogan. Very, very interesting. Yes, and, go into the summer with style. That's right. Yeah. Jeff, what are we doing next week? We're going to wrap it up. We're going to finally get to the end of, of the Aeneid. I'm looking forward to it. The, the, the ending is so haunting. As well as the interpretive portion. Yes. This one might have to stretch a little long. We'll see. We'll yeah. see how it goes. But I, I'm, I'm looking forward to talking about it. And, and wrapping it up. Yeah, yep. so am I. And Jeff, I believe you have the gustatory parting shot. I do. I think uh, I think you dug this one up. And I I'm, did. And I'm going to read it. This, do you like it? It, it bothers me. It's I, really it, disturbing. It's it disturbing, it? right? This is one from one Gustavo Ariano, who writes: Eating a burrito is like eating a living, breathing organism. You can feel the burrito's ingredients sigh inside with each bite. Each squeeze. It's Ooh. terrible, but and, uh, there's something <laughs> there's something accurate about it. Yes, there's a truth there, but I, it's a truth I do not want to. It's really into. disturbing. Thanks for listening. Thanks.